Uh, in your humble opinion, what is the best way to lose a few pounds of fat while training? We've never heard that one before. <laughs> Right. So, uh, first of all, if you're a novice strength trainee, uh, young or old, um, and you're not like morbidly obese, you shouldn't be thinking about losing weight as your first priority. You should be thinking about gaining weight, or at most, what we call a recomposition approach, of you know, uh, of maintaining your weight but having you know more muscle and less fat, which can be a bit tricky. But as a novice, your primary goal is, is to gain strength and to gain muscle, to gain mobility, uh, to improve your overall athletic performance. Because once you're really, really strong and really, really mobile and really, really balanced and well conditioned, it's going to be a lot easier uh, for you to start to lose fat while continuing to improve your strength. So. When somebody uh, comes to us and one of their goals is weight loss, we still have pretty much the same initial approach, which is to put them on a novice progression to make sure that they're eating enough to gain muscle or at least for a recomposition. And we hold off on really aggressive approaches to weight loss uh, for the intermediate period. And in the meantime, we find that um, during the novice progression, they will have lost some fat if they you know, attended uh, to their nutrition at all. Uh, we, you, know, you certainly don't want to start your novice progression and, you know, and still be eating you know, a, a gallon of ha haagen a day. Uh, you want to cut down on the candy, you want to cut down on the soda pop, you want to cut down on the whiskey. Um, those kinds of things that are obviously very fattening and don't contribute to your training. Um, but the primary goal as a novice is to gain strength and to gain to gain overall fitness and athleticism because with those in hand, fat loss is going to be a lot easier. And so it's during the intermediate period, which doesn't take that long to get to, um, that we turn our focus to more uh, aggressive um, approaches to minimizing body fat, if that's necessary. That all being said, it, it doesn't happen in the gym. It happens at the dinner table. And so when that time comes for us to aggressively turn our attention to, to some fat loss and a heavier trainee, that attention will come to play at the dinner table, not in the gym. Yeah, we'll push the prowler, we'll, you know, we'll do some conditioning work, um, but you know, the real work gets done um, in, in the nutritional strategy. So you're gonna decrease caloric input, you're gonna decrease your fat intake, you're gonna optimize your protein and carbohydrate intake, and you're going to, you know, we're, we're big fans of, of the so-called nutritional LP as uh, enunciated by Robert Santana, um, where we basically institute one healthy eating pattern and one healthy nutritional pattern every week. And once that's established, we move on to another pattern and build um, a network of healthy patterns that help to sustain each other uh, and support each other and change the athlete's relationship to food. So we could talk about this all day, um, but the bottom line is, um, you know, it's going, to be, it's going to be some level of caloric restriction, uh, optimizing protein, minimizing fat, and fine tuning the nutritional strategy and the athlete's relationship to food over a lifetime. Peter Ransome asks, as personal monitoring devices get cheaper and more ubiquitous, and since we old folks, sorry, athletes of aging, need longer and more variable and less predictable times to recover um, and risk more damage if not fully recovered and can benefit from as high a frequency as we can tolerate, what are your thoughts on objective recovery measures available before one sees in the gym that the weight reps effort are degrading? Perhaps HRV recovery at wake up on the second morning after a session or some measure of ability to stretch or grip strength. Uh, by the way, Eternal, thanks for your work. Thank you for your question, uh, Peter. Yeah, um, so I, I don't want to come off like a Luddite because I'm not, uh, but you know, people manage to train without this stuff for a long time, including older people. Um, I always prefer a more low-tech approach um, to training, just as I always preferred a more low-tech approach uh, to medicine. I saw you know, fancy stuff come and go uh, during my career as uh, a physician. Now, um, 
these kinds of you know high tech monitoring approaches, even though they're cheaper and more compact and more ubiquitous, as you say, in my opinion, they're still you know they add they add an extra le level of complexity. They're cumbersome, they're expensive, and when I look at the literature, I I think they're unproven. I I, I don't mean to say that there's nothing to them, um, but um, we just haven't had a need for them. I haven't had a need for them. Um, if you're sort of a physiology nerd and want to play with this stuff, that's great. Um, I can certainly empathize with that. But for most masters, uh, I think that this degree of precision um, probably isn't necessary. And, and I'm a fan of precision. So, you know, look in the comments for fitness nerds who are going to tell us I'm, you know, missing the next big thing. It may be a big thing to the professional athlete who's competing at a very high level, who's really, really pushing envelope, and who really needs to thread the needle of training on the red line all the time and still not wandering into overtraining. But that's not me, that's not my clients, and it's probably not you. Here at Gracio, where people are lifting for general strength and general conditioning and fitness, and, um, you know, and where people are getting PRs all the time and are performing physically, you know, more than two standard deviations from the mean for their demographic. Um, we've managed to do all that here without using, you know, fancy monitoring equipment like that. Um, good question. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to talk about it.